Okay, so welcome. I'm Alex. I'm the executive consultant at the Taos Institute, and I'm here today with Hayson Moon. Hayson, thank you so much for hosting this conversation. I'm gonna have you. Oh, I'm just so happy to be here and seeing so many of you. Like, I missed your faces. I didn't know that until I saw you. It's like, oh, I missed you. How are you? <laughs> uh, good to see you. And uh, Duane, you're so kind. Thank you. And what's interesting for me actually about this topic is exactly that. I wonder about wonder and Stephen, wonder is wonderful. <laughs> so I think this topic started with me when my nephew, who used to be younger and wiser, when he was like eight, he actually asked me this question. He said, why do we have to go to school? And I'm like, that's a good question. <laughs> And I think he actually said that because he has exam exam was coming up or something. I mean, who does the exam for eight year old? So he was actually asking, why do we go to school? And then that I sat with that for about three weeks thinking about it. Yeah, why do we go to school? And he's the guy, you know, who will actually ask stuff like, is there such thing as a mistake in art? I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy stresses me out <laughs> with these wonderments. So he was asking those questions when he was like five. So when I heard that question, I bought two notebooks, one for each of my nephews. And then um, with, with Nathan, I, I named his notebook Book of Wonder. And I'm collecting all his questions and wonderments. And I put it in uh, the notebook so that I can actually give it to him when he turns 18. So it started with that question. Why do we go to school? And also, uh, is there such thing as mistake in art? And when we went to art gallery, he asked me, we was, there are two paintings side by side by different people. And he said, well, I asked him, which one do you like better? And then he looked at me, he's like, how do you decide that? And then my older nephew was like, of course, the most expensive one. <laughs> so I was like, wow, this is capitalistic. This is great. So uh, I've been really wondering about this topic of wonder. So I thought so we can talk about how do we uh, go about uh, introducing wonder as a tool for learning. I don't want to call it a tool, but a way of learning. But also because of learning, you learn to wonder more. So how do we actually get people to learn to learn? And that's one of the questions that I wanted to start with you. So first question for you is this. Um, what are some things that you got to learn that had nothing to do with work? Okay, they didn't send you for training, but you somehow learned on your own because you were just so curious about it. What are some of those things that you learned? And it could be very small. It could have happened when you were much younger or just last week. What are some of the things that you learned? Or if you're learning something just out of pure wonder, sense of curiosity, what is it that you're learning? Please feel free to put in the chat box or unmute and speak as well. And I tell you, you know, I ask you this because I also wonder about how people choose to learn the topic and how they go about learning it. <laughs> so yes, feel free. If I, if I, can I jump in? Yes, please. Um, this reminds me of, well, I did some painting in the past as a visual artist and this thing you see beside me is a painting I made and there are four different layers underneath that I exhibited at different art ex uh, exhibitions. So when it was ready, I just killed my darlings and painted over it. <laughs> and then there was another one and another one. And then um, it wasn't sold, which is cool because now I have it here in my kitchen. Uh, when I was, when I'm at work as an artist, I'm not thinking in any way about mistakes or anything. I'm just uh, at work. So what you do is you um, create some, well, sense of wonder and you start to work with the material at hand. You, in a way, uh, in a dialogue with the paint with the paint and with the with the thing and you mm. scratch and you're putting on stuff and something disappears and something emerges and you're so curious about what might emerge not in any way thinking about 
what the what the result might be or if it might be good or something it's mm -hmm. more, like, more like enjoying the process and then mm -hmm. everything that emerges is simply what it is and not something that can be called <laughs> right or not because i did not upfront think about what might be good or what might be bad wow <laughs> yeah. really no wonder it's just i'm wondering wow what might happen if i take this paint away whoa hey what's that this hey and at the end you make some some painting like this, like this most of them at the end wow. well okay it's just fun and sometimes there's um, a good stuff but it's more like uh, quality emerges in the work in a way mm, that's amazing right last time i did it with the cooking see what emerges uh, i got my family members sick so <laughs> they got sick like what did you do i don't know i experimented please don't ever do that thank you <laughs> hey what, what else what other wonderments you know kind of um so here's the saying that i really love in adult education that learning is not cost but learning is occasioned so in a way it puts people in a situation where you're more likely to have the experience of learning, whether formally planned it that way or somehow we call it affordance. So an example of that is, um, I've seen so many two-year-olds who are barely speaking and they're like, num, num, num. It's like, I don't understand what you're saying, but then minute you actually pass them an iPad, <laughs> they just take it and then they know exactly where to go. Doop, doop, doop. This app, open this app and they don't know how to read but they know how to actually turn on their favorite app and start playing. And I was like, how do they do that? And it's because it's <clears throat> designed that way that it's it's easier for them to do. So in, um, uh, in industrial design, this idea of affordance is a big topic. How do we actually create this sense of affordance so that people are more likely? So for example, when you see a door, you have to, you're in a hallway, or shopping mall and there's a door and then the door does not have a handle what what does that ask what is it asking you to do to push <laughs> right so you want to probably like try to like oh there's no handle let me actually see if i can pull you wouldn't think about it you will push it affordance or when you actually see something it will have a sign on it to do something affordance so it's designed that way the interface is designed so that it's easier for even two-year-old to actually pick it up and press something. And then in a learning situation, how do we create that affordance so that people are more likely to wonder about something and learn? So other um, other examples of you learning, what have you learned? What are you learning? Carry the beach. And I think in that way, that sense of wonder is that awe, not just curiosity, right? So you're talking about that sense of awe. Wow. Stephen, human beings and relationship. <laughs> and I love when we uh, have phrases like, no wonder. <laughs> There's nothing new that I'm going to learn from you or the situation. No wonder. <laughs> so what do you mean by having that wonder? When we say, no wonder this happened. No wonder that happened. Right? Wow. Hey, what else? Uh, Tanya, the word is affordance. Yeah, there you go affordance there you go yes 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 thank you for that definition <laughs> what else what other examples do you have of um learning something out of curiosity out of that sense of wonder and don't think so hard it's okay you learn something i i have a friend when i was in high school she was she wanted to go to li library and i said why do you want to go to a library? And she's like, I really want to get a book. And I'm like, on what? And she's like, I want to learn because, you know, pretty soon I might have my first kiss and I don't want to be bad at it. I want to learn how to kiss before my first kiss happens. I'm like, I don't think that's how you learn kissing from reading a book. So when we think about the topic and how we learn, it's an interesting idea too. So, uh, just one more. What have you, what are you learning? What have you learned out of curiosity? Wow, Radu says, write orchestra music. Orchestra music, wow. Or orchestrate music, okay. Yeah, it's clearly a moment of wonder when you start putting all these instruments together and wow. 
starts to sound mm. beautiful. Wow, that's a pretty big wonderment to take on, eh? Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, the reason why I actually ask this question is when we say pedagogy of wonder, that is using wonder as a pedagogical way, but also people should have that increased sense of wonder. So, uh, I this question came back when I was teaching coaching. So that's my background in relational and dialogic process that I use coaching. And I remember early on, uh, some of my students, they were great learners. So when we did master class where everyone came and they do, they showcase their coaching session in front of everyone. So it's like 20 people watching you do live coaching. And then I'm just looking at their sessions and they start by this, asking this question and then the next question and then the next question. And then it's almost like if I take five of them, transcribe them, it's almost like their script is scripted. And then I thought, okay, hold on a second. They actually are asking the same questions. The question is, have they learned something other than those five questions? And that was a big question for me because sure, they're great learners, but they just memorize the lines. Have they, have they learned something? Now, when you look at children uh, playing with Lego, <laughs> the Lego actually has been around uh, my house for a long time. And uh, you know, the pain of stepping on one. <laughs> so <laughs> when we had Legos everywhere, and I remember uh, Nathan playing with Legos and he made this roadway to airport or something because we just came back from Cuba. And he has trees and he had runways and he had these like little trucks. And then just like Rick, you're saying, in about five minutes, he was done with it. So then he didn't change anything, but he started to call the tree. Now this is a person. And then I was like, what? It was a tree like five minutes ago. How, how is it a person? Well, it's a person now. And then he said, well, now this one, and he's pointing at the truck and he's like, so this will be, and then he's thinking, well, let's make it a dog. He didn't change anything, but he started calling it different things. And I said, you can't really do that. It doesn't work like that. You have to do change something to call it something else. And he's like, no, it's okay. I, it's, it's a different game, he said. And when I see him actually play with Lego and with the same 50 pieces, he was making endless configurations. Now, one of my students actually asked me in class, if you are not giving us anything, but if we are doing the process of learning, then are we actually learning anything? Because you are not answering our questions. You're not giving us extra knowledge, but we are actually doing it dialogically and relationally, then are we learning anything new? So these are some of the wonderments that I actually collected in class. I wanted to pose to you this question. So when you think about things that, I don't know how many of you are actually uh, trainers, teachers, educators, how many of you are actually teaching or uh, like, yeah, yeah, many of you, yeah. So. How do you know when people are learning? How do you know that? For you to say, yes, they learned something. How do you know that? Hi, good morning. And I'm sorry I'm late. Hello. Uh, I, for me, I think there, there are two quote unquote measures. One is the institutional measure. Here are your learning objectives and have they learned and the tests and all that, which is not what I lean on. Um, I mean, partially maybe somewhere, but I think it comes out of our practice of what we think we should be measuring as learning. I lean more on what the students are telling me in terms of the connections, the ahas they're having, uh, what they come and tell in between classes and where they struggle and where they're not, or somebody who comes after a year saying, I now know what you were. I like, what was <laughs> I doing? Now I know what you were doing. And 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 then they're talking about how they apply it in practice because I teach in a marriage and family therapy program. So a year later, they're in practice and so things are starting to click. So those are the ways that I know. It's like somebody- Wow. Yeah. When they actually tell you. Okay. Yeah, and then the follow-up being, 
so what did you learn right like like i'm still curious what is that uh, they're mm. pointing to that i did or they did and that is learning yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. what else is it Al alina yes yes alina. okay hey you have a same uh same coffee mug that i have <laughs> i yeah. just noticed i know that's so good right eh? <laughs> well, yeah what do Very you think <laughs> um so I resonate with what you were saying because I'm teaching and I'm coaching and mm. I think it's like a process sometimes and what often um, kind of the people reflect back to me is that sometimes they make sense of some things here intellectually but it doesn't go down and it's like the learning oh, how it needs to be embodied it's like they understand it on a cognitive level but it, it's like it makes sense in my head but I still cannot really implement it right it's like it kind of it makes sense but I still reverse back to my autopilot or my normal behaviors because I know but I don't really know you know it's like and there is still this gap so I think the learning happens when they actually kind of embody it and actually apply it and implement it so it comes come down kind of I feel like it comes down from the head to the body and that's like when this kind of aha learning it's like oh now that I've used that it's like now it makes sense now I've mm. learned something I applied it. You know, that's interesting because <clears throat> my assumption is people are learning all the time. And when they come for something like coaching, how do I know that it was my influence? It was something to do with me that they got to learn that. And I think there's a push in the industry for things like ROI. I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> it's like, how do you like draw a little line at swimming pools? Like this was my influence how do we do that right that's so interesting and uh, in being in adult education i hear these words like pedagogy and andragogy how many of you actually have heard this term andragogy you know what that means right and this whole pedagogy and andragogy thing was actually the first thing i learned when i was doing masters in adult education and i was like okay that's pretty cool like what do you mean by what's the difference and pedagogy to andragogy term actually was <clears throat> the first coined actually in I think early 1800s by this German teacher, his name is Alexander Kapp. And he was a school teacher who realized, wait a second, how actually adults learn, looks and feels, and he thinks that something is different about that than how children learn. So when we think about <clears throat> children, we kind of assume that teacher is the one who decides what they should learn and how they should learn. And we follow this traditional approach of teaching of children, pedagogy. <laughs> and then when Alexander Kapp is like making a note about something is different about how adults learn. And that idea was actually pretty much buried for about hundred years until American psycho educational psychologist, he actually brought it up again and popularized this term andragogy. And andra, as you, many of you know, it means uh, teaching of men or learning of men but it means adults these days. And then uh, it's been really big because when adults learn, we may not decide what we, how we learn it, but we can decide what we wanna learn. For many of you who were actually learning to paint or doing different things, you learned in a specific way that you probably have chosen. You might have actually, um, here's something that I am doing and I don't know what I was thinking when I registered for this class. Somebody said they have a really good teacher. You should go check it out. And it, this is an area that I know nothing about, but still I register for it. You know what it is? I'm good at many things, but not this one. And it's not a cooking class. <laughs> okay. Just take a wild guess. What class would be a class where I am the worst in? <laughs> and it's a dance class. I don't dance. Jeff, I don't know if it's a compliment you got it right or if it's an insult. I don't know, Jeff. <laughs> you actually guessed it right. What's happening here? And it's not just any dance. It's Afro Soka dance. Okay. I really think my I, people who do this dance have extra joints I, I, that I don't have. But anyway, I actually uh, signed up for it. I went to the first class completely lost and I looked so intense. And the teacher, the instructor came to me and it's like, just feel it. You don't have to think it. And I don't know how to do that. How do you just feel it and not think it? <laughs> how do you move your body without thinking? 
So I've been struggling with it by week three. I was a little bit better. And because I was a little bit better, I wanted to be better at it. So what do I do? Of course, I actually look it up on YouTube. And then there are so many apps of Afrosoka, do this, do that. And I'm actually looking at it and doing it on my own at home. And it's interesting because dance is something that I would never, I would have signed up for and practiced at, home, practiced at home. Now, what made that difference? Because adults, we, we, when we take interest in something, we want to learn it, then we find a way to learn it. So andragogy and pedagogy difference was actually that. It's self-directed. So if we want to learn this, then we will direct ourselves to learn that. Now, here's a third term that I actually learned that not a lot of people know, seem to know about. And it's on the spectrum from pedagogy, andragogy. And then the last one that they're actually playing with right now, it's called, let me actually write it down in the chat box. It's called, for those of you who are trying to um, pronounce this, so every time somebody pronounces, I say, bless you, because it sounds like hiragoji. It's like, whoosh, right? It's a hiragoji. And this is a term that I wanted to introduce today with that idea of wonder. And hiragoji is the term that has words like heuristic. So when you hear words like heuristic, it has the same word, hiragoji, same word as in hiragoji. Now, what does that mean? Where does it come from? Hiragoji or heuristics. And Tanya, you were like, oh, you know, it's something with words. Yes, <laughs> it has something to do with words. And then the word that we actually have um, commonly in hiragoji and heuristics is, do you know the story of this guy who was tasked with finding out if the gold crown was pure gold. And he's like, I don't know how to actually do that. I wonder how one can do that. And he's sitting in this bathtub, thinking and thinking and thinking. All of a sudden he got it. Oh, this is, I think I know. And he, the story goes, he goes out naked in the, naked in the street and calling Eureka. Yes, some of you familiar with the story? So Eureka is, I found it. I discovered it. So that's the Greek root word in the words like heuristics or hiragogy. How do we actually create that environment for learners to discover the, for themselves? And that, may, that means our role as educators change. If you want to create that sense of wonder that we are not teachers or instructors, instruct as in we put in the structure in them, instruct, <laughs> we are not even... Uh, we're moving very fast from the role of facilitator. We're not even facilitating. But then what is the role of educators in hiragogy? And that's something that I thought about for a long time. And it seems like, especially living in a day and age where we don't have any more limitations in uh, accessing information. In fact, we struggle with a flood of misinformation and what is the job what is the role of educator and it looks like we are getting closer and closer to curating so curating information curating knowledge curating things like that if instead of actually showing up with pre-planned reading list how do we curate based on now what the learners are wondering about so uh, before I actually introduce a couple other things, I wanted to actually pause here and ask you for what kind of wonderments that you have <laughs> about this whole trend that is actually moving closer. And especially this uh, hiragoji is uh, becoming pretty popular, especially um, as we go through the pan pandemic, the whole world, world actually was forced to take um, a bit of shift in how people learn. And the shiragoji is where learners not only decide how they're going to learn, but they also decide what they are going to learn, which is typically what happens in coaching conversations. But let me pause here and ask you for, I don't know, your thoughts. What do you think about this idea of shiragoji? Wow, Tanya, it's amazing, by the way, you have all these like definitions. Wow. Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Hello, nice to be here with all of you. Yes. 
I, I think what I was thinking when you put the definition of, or when I looked up you to Koji and, and listened to you is, I, I wonder the ways it feels like it continues to separate the teaching from the learning. Because it does feel like it places the teacher or the coach or the, as separate from, and yeah, I come from an early childhood background a long time ago. I've now spent most of my life in adult development and learning environments. Mm -hmm. And in early childhood, there's always been this back and forth between teacher centered and child yes. directed. And from early on, it made me uncomfortable because it felt mm -hmm. like you, that was a false dichotomy. Children are not going to grow and develop in the absence mm -hmm. of their relationship to the rest of the world, which includes adults. So to me, what was much more interesting was the organization of that relationship and the wow. how, and that's true for me with adult. So to me, the amazing thing is the moment I feel like I know, whatever, no, the class is learning is when I'm <laughs> learning too. Um, yes. It's when we're we're creating an environment together to do something we hadn't done before. And it's not that I'm in the same role as them because there's some expertise I bring. Um, but I think I, I'm always concerned when there's that, there's a very mm -hmm. stark separation as because it reminds mm -hmm. me of times when the teacher becomes more passive, which I don't think is the healthiest thing for anybody's development. Mm -hmm. And Carrie, I think that's what it's actually called the new old way of learning because we used to have like, here's a teacher. And then now we sort of do, here's the teacher facilitator. And then do we actually then keep teacher? Where is the role of a teacher? So I really appreciate that because this is not about here's a teacher and here's the learner versus what are they doing together and what's the role that we play in that interplay, right? And I think that's the piece that we're trying to restore. Well, I am trying to restore in classrooms. And I think we. I just had a class on Saturday and I asked them, you know, I have hardest time, my dilemma as, uh, you know, as a professor in grad unit graduate unit in 2023 or 2024 is it <laughs> is that i still have to grade your papers <laughs> and that's that's a big dilemma for me right wow that's so cool i think i actually saw a hand was that uh i think it was joan yes no yeah it was you know um, um i've been thinking a lot about um kind of the the purposes of education and and so I'm loving this conversation and and I think as um artificial intelligence begins to kind of curate information for people because I think about chat GPT is kind of a a ways way in which you know information is curated for people um and um and information is so ubiquitous I think that some of the power in education becomes not um, about the knowledge as much as creating meaning for human beings. Mm -hmm. What is it that meaning, what is it that this information means about being human? And how do we embody pieces of information to create ourselves as human? And so I think it changes what happens online and in classrooms changes the conversation about ideas. Um, and so I put in the chat this idea of a community of learners working with a community of learners because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm old enough to, to you know, I've seen that arc of instruction from really a pedagogical stance to where yes. it is it is now. And it's really so much more about um teacher as learner and uh, and building that community uh, amongst mm. us as learners. And Joanna, I think it's so interesting to look at it that way because uh, pedagogy, when it was teacher-centered, as much as we want to believe that uh, andragogy was not, still andragogy was very much curriculum-centered. So this is the curriculum, this is how it's designed and you learn it now. It's type of I'm sure the teacher is no longer really in that position, but still is curriculum centered. And now um, we're moving to even people coming into coaching conversation and we don't know what they want to learn until we have that conversation. And then what's the role of, what do we do <laughs> in that interaction? <laughs> yes, Jeff. Well, I, yeah, I, I, um, 
I've been really intrigued by this uh, language that we have of teacher, learner, mm-hmm. and practices mm-hmm. of learning. <clears throat> I'm um, based in, in Wales. Um, I don't speak Welsh, but there, I understand there's a Welsh word uh, for learning teaching, which huh. encompasses both concepts. They call it, uh, yes. it's dusgi. But they don't have a separate word for mm. teaching and learning because they see the process as an interactional one. Exactly. It's just making me think about, again, our language, uh, we talk about having knowledge, you know, something we have. But I, I've been more and more and more thinking about knowledge as something we do. And so, you know, your question earlier about how do I know when I'm having an influence as a, as a teacher, mm-hmm. that um, it's probably when you're interacting with somebody in, in a particular understanding or um, position, uh, it's what you do together. So I, th- I had a, an example, people may have heard this before, um, I heard this in a kitchen somewhere, so don't ask me to court this. Uh, a teacher was uh, working with little little kids and had a, a board with animal pictures on it. And clearly the idea was to see if the kids could identify the different animals and name them. So she points to a sheep and she asks, let's say, Josephine, you know, what is that? And Josephine says, I'm not sure. And so she goes to Johnny and says, Johnny, what is it? And Johnny says, it's a sheep. And there Johnny gets a gold star because he called it a sheep. (laughs) But if the teacher had asked Josephine, what is it you're not sure about? Josephine Mm. said, I'm not sure whether it's a marina or an angora. (laughs) So so the the teacher's knowledge of what it is Mm. creates a kind of situation of what their expectation is of what the learner should should be doing or, or responding. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a, I think, monological process. Oh, Jeff, absolutely. Uh, yes. Whereas I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, and yet, you know, there's different kinds of, of, of uh, learning and, and teaching um, where um, I like that idea of, of um, what was it, affordance, uh, uh, something yes. about what enables someone to learn mm-hmm. and what activity we can bring to a situation uh, which brings forth something in what we do with rather than something mm-hmm. we have inside us somehow or the other. Yes, and I think, Jeff, some of the things that I find um, sometimes challenging is when um, in class where, let's say, it's a math class where you th- we think that it's math has formula, it has answers. So yesterday I was sitting there with a, a pastor at church and pastor's kid was like saying something. Like, oh, it was, like, it was so amazing. It was like, I would do that like gazillion times. So she's seven gazillion times. And uh, this pastor used to be a teacher. And uh, pastor said, so... Um, can so how much is gazillion and the kid is like i don't know it's like gazillion and he says so what's a gazillion minus four (laughs) and the kid is like gazillion minus four and i found that conversation very intriguing because it it reminded me of a math teacher who was teaching my nephew's class and and asking children group of children and this is a math class there's an answer clear answer and uh teacher said well okay so we are now at number three and i think they had a scale from one to ten they're learning about numbers we're at a three and we want to get to nine how do you get to nine and then exactly like jeff it's kind of like you're, you're teaching like josephine what how do you get to nine and then she said well three so plus four now that's a wrong answer in my mind. And then teacher said, okay, three plus four. And then what else? I'm like, what do you mean? What else? How can you, what else this situation? This is a wrong answer. And then another kid goes, so we're at seven plus three. I'm like, oh my goodness, these children, like like properly teach that multiplication chart or something. Oh, it's a addition. It's, it's, what are you doing? And teacher just went over saying, okay, plus three, oops. Ooh, went over 
we went over nine. Then what do you do now? And then another kid goes, minus one. And then she said, voila, we are here. And I was just so dumbfounded. I just, I'm standing by the door hear, hearing all this happening. If you can teach math like this, and you just made everyone right. <laughs> and everyone participated in this like simple three plus six situation and everyone participated. And that was, and I had to tell the teacher like, this is amazing. I learned how to teach just by listening to your three minute instruction here. And I think Jeff, that's that's like I, I really appreciate that you bring that up because um when we divide this role as what does the teacher do, what does the student do, and that even is uh it's nebulous. It's, I don't know if it's real <laughs> because whenever I my um students ask me something, I learn from their question. Mm -hmm. And I actually then ask them, so you must have a quest in that question, because you know that's your wonderment and i want to learn about you know where you're coming from and that conversation becomes exactly about i am learning from them they're learning from this conversation and we're learning together and i think even when people say well what's the difference between coaching and therapy one of the most popular questions that people ask in class and do i have a, an answer to that i actually don't in that conversation with that person because i don't know what they are thinking and then how do we actually maintain that sense of wonder when I especially think I know the answer? And when I ask people question, if I already know the answer, then I shouldn't be asking that question anyway. Yes, Rick. Yeah, riffing on the on Jeff and also on a remark of Carrie in the in the chat. Um, I think uh, for my own work, the role of uh, language is so very important. Like when we have a word that encompasses both, say, opposites, then for me working from jazz education, when I say comping, then I'm learning. And you don't have to split it up. So there are no, no demarcations around its teaching or something else. It is encompassed in the feeling. So when in an embodied way, you help people understand what this is all about by listening to records or playing something, whatever, then it's getting embodied, connecting with the inner noise that is not yet uh, ex being expressed in words that package it, mm. then it's, it's getting embodied. And for instance, mm -hmm. it's really weird when you work in that way with business, uh, with IT architects, then somehow <laughs> after that, when they embodied these ideas, then suddenly the architecture, the design that's, that's appearing in the, in the software de development is mm -hmm. they are showing up <laughs> So some instances, some noise that are based on learning, on inviting mm -hmm. people to learn. Yes. But, but when you use words like teaching, sometimes it mixes it up because it already puts you in that groove of, okay, it's that, so it's not that. And Rick, that's uh, one of the ways that I am learning to teach also, that uh, I had to sub in for my uh, music teacher actually last week. And I'm teaching these small ch people. I think we call them children, yes. <laughs> so I'm teaching this kid who was like six. And she made a very simple thing. She made this beautiful sound. Now, the teacher specifically asked me to assess. So I'm, I'm assessing Delsa. That's her name. So I'm like, oh, wow. So Delsa, play that and let me hear you because I am assessing. And when I hear her, and she played, actually, the tone was beautiful so as i'm watching her play i was thinking wow maybe it's the mechanic of her wrist that she learned how to do that that's amazing so i'm actually analyzing this because i am assessing assessing of her learning and then i thought as i watch it too that she got some things wrong so i'm like okay so maybe we can change and i can do it this way and what was amazing is then i am using assessment actually for learning too not only of learning, but for learning. But when she and when she um, stopped playing, I actually, it was a group class. So I asked all the kids, I said, so what did you like about how Delsa played this? And those are, you know, young, like young people, like they're seven or eight, six, seven, eight. And this one little boy, he said, well, every note was very clear. 
And I was like, that's true. I didn't really think about that because I was busy watching the wrist movement. Okay. And then to the next kid, I was like, what about, what about you? What did you really like about how Delsa played? And everyone had an answer. And there are six, seven, eight beginner students for piano. And I'm listening to their answers. And I just then asked Delsa, how were you able to like create such nice tone? What did you do? And I had an answer, partial answer of, well, you moved your wrist really well. But you know what Delsa said was, well, when I was playing, I thought of my right hand as the inside noise and my left hand was outside noise. I have no idea what that means. So then I was like, I don't know what that means. What do you mean? We ended up having this conversation about how she's producing the sound and somehow the wrist was, she was not focusing on the wrist. Wrist came because she was thinking that way. And Rick, thank you for <laughs> introducing this music metaphor because I was really moved to learn that from the six-year-old. And uh, yeah, I play a hundred times better than she does, but I didn't <laughs> know that story. <laughs> Janet. Well, I'm so happy to be part of this conversation. Yay, you. <laughs> Still. <laughs> it's like, how do you bring together every brilliant thing that was said so far? But I'm thinking about, I'm wondering about wonderment and mm. everything that we've been saying about it and how you're creating this environment where there are people who have real expertise and skill and people who have the kind of inside hand and the outside hand and the, the, at every level, pre, people bringing something to the wonderment. And I'm, wonder, I'm kind of, from everything you're saying, beginning to think about wonderment as like a completative activity where we're mm -hmm. giving some new shape to it that we're going on together, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a qualitative shaping without giving, quote, the answer, right? With like in your math example, um, no answer was coming out of that, but the wonderment activity allowed everyone to, to play with some of those concepts. I don't know. How do you think about that? Yes. And I think it's, it's Janet, in a way it is conceptual. And also it's kind of like how, like moving forward, like how do we include it? And all those things are, um, yes, that's exactly what I want to see more of. And then there's that pressure. So for example, now, I have to go and grade students' papers. <laughs> These are graduate level students and I have to grade their papers. So there's that tangible. So how do I, in that tension, how do I still maintain that room for wonder? So I wanted to share something very tangible with you if, if you're still okay. <laughs> are, you, are you okay? Yeah. So when I teach coaching as dialogic and relational practice, and first of all, when you hear coaching, there's so many things around the definition that we have no definition of coaching, really. There are many definitions, but not one. Now then, what makes it difficult is assessing. How do we assess? There are some competency framework and so on that feels like very loose net, doesn't really catch anything for me. <laughs> so when I hear competency, or competence, two are very different things. But when I hear those words, what what makes me really wonder is um, who has, who who's most accurate to assess one's learning? Is that the learner? Is that the instructor or whoever, the educator, whatever you call them? Or is that external observer, the third party? When I ask this question to um, in coaching class, it's half and half. People say, of course, um, the external observer, they will actually have a really good objective view on what good coaching is. And when you look at actual communication science research, observers have the least amount of uh, shared meaning. So they have probably the least accurate um, understanding of what actually took place in that interaction. So the Rashomon effect, for example, that two people are in conversation, one person watching, and Jana Bavalas from Victoria, when she did research using the 10 gram study. So three people in, like they're sitting together, but person one, person two, they're actually talking about just, they have the same sheet with 10 gram. Those 
um, vague objects on a piece of paper, like 21 of them. And they look like it's a shape that's not really clear. And now they have to make meaning together. So they'll, so one person will be like, you know, that shape that looks like a little a person with a left leg up. So now the other person has to look at their sheet. It's like, uh, yes, I, yes, this one, this one with the hand to the left. Yes. So they're doing that meaning making together. Third person is sitting right there with the same sheet, but they're not participating. They're just listening too. Now, afterwards, they do repeat that study a couple more times. And then the following week, they come back and they do the same thing. And this time, because two people who are engaged in the conversation, they have shorthand, so to speak, because they already have accumulated shared understanding. So then instead of saying, you know, the one that looks, they skip all that. They say, you know, remember that dancer with the leg up with the uh, left hand up? Yes. That time is much shorter because there is that mutual understanding that's already established. But then what happens is the third person who is sitting there observing the time that they get, the time for them did not decrease because they're not, not part of that meaning making, even though they're sitting in the same place, same time. So when they replicate these studies, what they're saying is people who will hold probably the most precise understanding of what took place are those two people who were actually in that interaction. Doesn't matter if you're watching it or not, those two people who are engaged in, they will have the most accurate information. That means when we have coaching, coach and client and external observer, the least um, accurate person to assess it will be that external observer. But still in our coaching industry, we take such, we privilege or prioritize that external observer view as the most accurate, which is a huge problem. What are they looking? What are they looking for anyway? And usually when we do uh, evaluation afterwards, usually coach and client, they have uh, consistently a similar evaluation where the third party consistently rate the coaching session as poor quality, poorer than what the, what those two will actually rate. So give in that context now, how do we assess student learning? Because that's my job. I have to do that. I have to produce something. That's the tension. So here is what I sort of, what I've been using as uh, that tension, how to respond to that is using assessment uh, not of learning or even for learning. When you use assessment for learning, we call that uh, formative assessment, right? And when you do assessment of learning, it's called summative. So this is something that's quite well known in adult education, but how do we use assessment as learning? And I think many of us, we already do that in social construction, sort of constructionist ideas. How do we, we know that assessment actually is uh, learning assessment, doing that assessment itself is already learning. And how do we do that? So um, I have this heuristic of interaction that I have developed. Many of you already know about, and it's a simple tool of organizing conversations. So when I sit down with my student and they come to me and say, well, can you actually supervise my work? And I have a hard time with that idea of supervising. So I say, okay, I will have a super vision on what you do really well and so on. But let me ask you a couple of questions. So I start with the interview question and I ask them, so what do you want me to notice that you do really well? What do you want me to pay special attention to? So I interview my learner first and then I write down those uh, uh, answers. And I use this organizing map, which looks like a matrix from left to right. There's a there's a horizontal line and there's a vertical line. How many of you know of this dialogic orientation quadrant, by the way? Okay. Some of you are not too familiar. That's totally fine. And I'll come to you, Sanhya, in, in, in a minute. Okay. So here's a new whiteboard. Let me see if I can do this. You see the whiteboard? Let me show you something very simple, actually, because this is what I use as assessment as learning. I don't know how to use the whiteboard. So you see the, uh, the tool where I can write something? 
Or am I just missing that? Okay, there's more yeah, board. Look like this was set for only people within the TALS organization. Okay, right. interesting. Okay, I don't, I, I don't know how to use this. Forget it. So close that out. You don't see the whiteboard. So what I wanted to draw actually is, uh, maybe let me do this whiteboard. Does that work? Yes, it does. You see this? Yeah, it's the same thing. You can't really do anything with this. Okay, forget it. So here is uh, left to right, past to future. When we listen to people's narrative, we're organizing by timeline, left to right. And top to bottom, vertical, is what people say that they want more. And on the bottom is what people say that they want less. It's a simple matrix. So quadrant one is something that people say that they want in the future. That's preferred future. And uh, the other side is something that happened in the past that people really liked. It's uh, examples of like maybe interactions, experiences that they really enjoyed. We call it resource for past. And the third one on the bottom is what happened in the past that that was not their preference. It's like, oh, I wish that didn't happen. We call it trouble past. And then the last one we call uh, the dreaded future. So four areas, prefer future, dreaded future, and resource, resource for past and trouble past. And what people do is simply listen to your client and map their conversations. So where is your client? And often people say, oh, I had a negative client. They just complained the nonstop. It's like, oh, is that right? And let's actually look at what happened in the conversation. And then we look at this right before the client starts to complain, we go, go to what you asked for. And sure enough, they asked for it. So for example, client will say, I'm just struggling right now with this. And yeah, I'm really hoping that I will see some positive difference, but yeah, right now I'm stuck. And of course the coach, when they ask, tell me more, where do you feel like you're stuck? And then client's like, oh, I'm stuck here. And then a whole complaint, whatever they call complaint begins. And then we turn around and blame the client for, you're so negative, but hello, we made a request in our question. So question doesn't, like it has quest of the person, but also it's requesting. The function is you're making us explicit request that they answer my assumption. So when learners are using this map to look at their own work, we do this twice in a um, coaching course. One is when they first come in first day within first hour, I ask them before we talk about anything to do with coaching, I say, okay, so now you pair up, go videotape a session, coaching session, whatever you think is coaching. And your task is very simple. Try to be useful and have a conversation, 10 minute conversation, record it. And they all record it. And we call that baseline. And they do baseline a set, an analysis of, on the map. So they do that themselves. And I asked them, so what do you think? What, what's your best guess of what happened? What went well? And what do you want to see different? And I actually asked them specifically to reflect on what kind of client did you have? And I would never ask this in a real situation, but I'm going, what kind of client was it? What kind of topic was it? So that they're really assessing it. And then later on, as they learn about how we use assumptions in our questions, and our every response to client narrative is just an expression of our wonderment at the time. And then they do this video again in about five weeks. And their job is to simply sit with their own work baseline and their later session and truly just look at what are you doing different now? What do you know now that you didn't even know that you didn't know? So I have a set of questions that they go through so that I am not grading them. And this is what ChatGPT will never be able to do, reflection. <laughs> so they're doing critical reflection of their sessions going from baseline to later sessions. So 
Assessment as learning is what we use in hiragogi, and we call it ipsative assessment. So ipsative is using you, yourself, is self-reference. You are your own reference of learning. So I'm not gauging you against other people, which is norm referenced. I'm not looking at your behavior according to this criteria, which is competencies or criterion-based assessment. All I am doing in class now is called ipsative assessment, where I make sure that you are your own reference. I have 24 people in my class. Every one of them have different baseline. And every one of them will have different subsequent sessions, but then they're learning in that in that between space is what I am grading. So I wanted to share uh, something a little bit tangible as uh, I find myself in this dilemma or tension in adult education, but I find this way of working really, really useful. <laughs> so that's why I call it. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to call it pedagogy of wonder is because I realized people have way more questions once I design my class this way. They have more, more, more questions. Each time they do their practice, now they have like 10 more questions. I don't answer them because I don't, I don't actually don't have answers. But they, as you say, Joe, they come together as community. They ask each other those questions. They play with conversations with that question in mind, their quest in mind. And they discover those answers for themselves. And I think that's what makes our um, learning even richer living in 2024. So I actually wanted to share that with you. And hey, questions or comments. I would really appreciate getting questions and comments from all the brilliant minds here. What's your quest? <laughs> Feel free to unmute as well and type if you would like. Hi, thank you. I have to admit, I missed a tiny bit of this last part because I got an email from work about about assessment. Actually, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I was I was thinking a whole lot of things. I mean, one is, I think as I think of assessment often as the like byproduct of the institutions we've created. Right. And so for me, I do it as a performance. Mm. I, I I play with it, and I yes, I I don't. I think I've come to believe that there isn't a way to make assessment fully democratic because the institution isn't fully democratic. Mm -hmm. So within that, I've tried all sorts of things and I love some of the suggestions that you're making and I'm definitely going to make use of them. But it was very freeing for me to realize that it the concept of assessment runs counter to my understanding of learning. No, and so no, if I'm going to do it, which I have to do, um, and I don't even find it unuseful within the academy, I actually mm. think it, it it helps students in a certain way because of the institutional yes. environment. Oh, but it hinders the kind of learning we started with yes, talking about, exactly. right? It, there's no it way does. for it not to hinder it because it, yeah. um, even if it we do, say we're going right? to do it together, I... <laughs> But yes. what doesn't hinder it is that is that kind of I make it as unimportant as I possibly can when it can be. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I just found some of the suggestions you made so creative. And it reminded me that even in that experience I have of it being impossible to mm -hmm. change it within the constraints, it is possible to be creative with it and that I can keep yes. can keep doing that. And I think, Carrie, I get in so much trouble from my department almost every semester because they're like, how can you have students like getting all A's? I'm like, well, if you wonder why, then look at their assignments. And I give them the reflection paper and they're like, this is really good work. I'm like, uh, hello. So I just end up with like all A students. Do you have a problem with that? <laughs> like, it's just, I get in trouble every single semester because of that. <laughs> but they really do the work and I just can't. I don't see anyone unless they miss like half the class and they don't hand in stuff. They really produce that work because we create them to learn that way. And, and they're excited about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. But even the, when you say, even if they miss half the class, because I, similarly, I have rules about that because I'm with it. Yeah. Oh, how, we all do, right? how odd would it be if that's what we did with babies? 
right? Like, <laughs> oh, even though they didn't babble today, you know, well, they didn't babble today, so they're not real. Like, I just think it's, oh, yeah. it's even those constraints make people more passive in their learning. All of those Absolutely. things, but Carrie, they are that's... what we have to work with. Exactly. When we live in uh, this society where we expect perfect attendance or we privilege perfect attendance is a good thing. I remember going through school and I I didn't miss a day of school in the entire like elementary school. And I got this little award for not missing a school. And I question it. Why do we actually award those behaviors? What if you're sick? What if you're that? And not missing a school is a measure of success. Hello, I don't understand that. <laughs> so absolutely, Carrie. Ibrahim, I see your hand. Hello. Hello. Uh, I have a question, actually. It's not exactly related to the topics, but somehow related. Um, I know you are a solution-focused practitioner, and um, I had um, solution-focused training from different prominent solution-focused trainers. And the, the, the most fearful thing is uh, to be problem focused instead of solution focus. <laughs> so, is it? so I, in, 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 in every question, in, in, in every question, in every tool, in approach, I have to be solution focused. However, uh, I had some difficulties with some trainers because although I think I am asking a solution focused question, they say, no, it is not not proper solution focused question. It, yeah. it is some somehow problem focused Sorry, question. That's so, slightly painful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Recently, I, I I read books about cognitive linguistics, and I, I all of a sudden I I found two terms. Um, uh, one of them is categories, and one of them is prototypes. So. Wow. In, in cognitive linguists, they give them examples of bird, and and, mm -hmm. and sparrow is a prototype of bird. Mm -hmm. Typical, it is all the features of bird it contains. However, ostrich is not flying, so it's it's bird, but it, it's not <laughs> little bit not similar. The typical prototypes. It's a sheep the, woman, uh, yes. Yeah. On the <laughs> other hand, the penguins are. Can't fly, <laughs> it, but still, it's birds. So, so very distant from the prototype, but it's still birds. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for solution focus, what, what there are pro, some prototype questions, some mm -hmm. prototype answers, and mm -hmm. prototype uh, approaches. But, what is your opinion? Still, it's not prototype, but it's still solution focus. I mean. Not sparrow, okay. but penguin, but it's it's still birds. Right, so, right. Can you share well, your, your answer? I would love to end. And before I do, I know that uh, I realize that we're uh, past our time. So if you need to go, please go. Thank you so much for being here. But I will stay on for a few more minutes if you have questions. So feel free. Don't feel guilty leaving. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> But so good to have all of you. And I'll stay on for a few more minutes. If you want to stay on, feel free to do that. Yeah, I there also you go. want to say the conversation can continue in the Taos Institute comments. So feel free to yes. post your questions there. Absolutely. And everyone can continue to contribute. Um, mm -hmm. 